You know that shame and that grief when you have had this angry outburst, this mom aggression, and you see fear in your children's eyes. That shame and that grief, because I do. And in this podcast episode, I'm sharing a vulnerable moment with therapist and Christian Carla Ages, because she is someone who has been dealing with that, dealing with OCD, dealing with suicidal tendencies, and she knows how to address OCD in children. There's a difference between having a symptom, having mental health issues like she does. She's diagnosed bipolar and borderline, and the diagnosis is not your identity. Jesus And your faith is your identity. So this is a very healing episode in the podcast. We're going to talk about how grief and shame and episodes like that can either destroy you or you can heal through them. And Carla will share the two different strategies for that. She's also going to share the challenges of having been brought up in traumatic childhood trauma and traumatic circumstances and how to avoid bringing that into your parenting as an autism mom or an autism mom just in general. So we're talking about faith, we're talking about healing, we're talking about OCD and how to deal with that in your child. And you're going to understand how to involve Jesus, how to take scripture and implement it and enhance your healing journey through that. So welcome to this podcast episode. Let's get to it. I am here with my sister in Christ, Carla Adjes, and I think we're going to be talking about some difficult topics today, some painful topics, which is probably mostly things that we all suffer with and struggle from and hide from and try to escape from, but so taboo topics. But if we don't talk about them, if we don't address them, if we don't face them, if we don't know what to do about them, two things can happen. We either lose our faith in God or just get confused about why this is happening to us, or it gets worse. And you, Carla, you've got an incredible story and quite uh, some diagnoses and Today, we're going to talk to moms who have children with diagnoses, but we also, as autism moms, often struggle with mental health issues. Mm -hmm. So why are you doing what you're doing and why is it important to you? How did it all begin? Well, thank you so much for having me, Ninka. Um, And while I don't have a child with autism, I do have a child with pretty severe OCD, So I do know what it's like to have to support a child that's struggling. And I think it's fantastic that you have this podcast and that you are reaching out to moms and supporting them. So I applaud you for all your effort. Um, Likewise. Thank you. So my journey started really as a child and where I am now today working as a Christian mental health coach is never where I would have foreseen myself. Um, being a product of childhood trauma and having mental illness challenges, I actually never thought I would live past my 20s. So it is a testimony to God's goodness that I'm here today. I um, recognize that. I recognize that feeling. Tell tell us a little bit more about that. Or maybe you want to just continue and then come back to that suicidal um, tendency or thoughts that you had. Yeah. Because I know many moms with children who struggle have that. Yes. So it started when I was young. I grew up in a home. Um And I will say this because sometimes it sounds like I'm talking very harshly about my parents. I believe that most parents do the best that they can with what they have and that my parents had their own baggage of trauma that in that generation was never dealt with. And so it passed on. There's generational passage of trauma. And so they passed on what in their heart of hearts they wouldn't have wanted to pass on, but it happened. And so I grew up in a home where there was untreated 
mental illness. My mom has mental illness and it was untreated and it created a lack of sense of security. And really when we talk about trauma, sometimes we just think about shock traumas, like big assaults or big accidents where trauma, especially when we're looking at kids with trauma, that developmental trauma or that complex trauma, it really has to do with not feeling safe and secure, having an event happen where you feel helpless. And in early childhood life, when you're trying to create a secure bond with your parents, when that secure bond fails to happen, you can grow up in with a trauma informed brain, a brain that's been developed in the construct of trauma. And so it operates differently. And I remember I really struggled living in a what was supposed to be a Christian home and then having these parents where I didn't know if I was going to be loved one day or ignored one day. I didn't I never knew what to expect. There was always this walking on eggshells and fear that love was going to be withheld, that I wasn't going to be good enough that day to receive love. Um, There was definitely a little bit of violent tendencies in my home, Mm -hmm. um, which created more of a fear environment as well. And I struggled with the goodness of God in all of that. And while I had given my heart to God as a child in my teenage years, it became really hard for me to trust the goodness of God while I was living out my experiences. And when I was 13 was the first time that I tried to take my life um, and just felt so disillusioned. Um, I was living on my own since I was 14. My parents kicked me out of the house. And in trying to cope with that, um, you know, 14, you're still a child. Like you're, you're not developed. Um, it led to a lot of bad coping mechanisms, drinking, drugs, um, and really just numbing, right? We, we tend to want to numb pain. Mm-hmm. And I get it. No one likes to feel pain. The challenge is we can't heal what we don't feel. And it takes going through the hard emotion in order to release the hard emotion. And I didn't know that. I just numbed. Um, And I came to a a crossroads at one point. I've had a couple of crossroads, (laughs) but early in my 20s, where God was just really calling me home, Mm -hmm. like a prodigal daughter, just wanting to love on me and helped me to get my footing. And coming back into his embrace was like coming home, but to a good home. Mm. Now that didn't change things overnight. You know, I think sometimes in the Christian community, we think that it's just prayer and supernatural intervention. And yes, God is a supernatural God and he moves and he works and he's always working. But oftentimes he partners with us Mm -hmm. that our prayers are answered in partnership with the Holy Spirit in doing the work. Mm -hmm. So God didn't supernaturally take away all my wounds of trauma. He didn't supernaturally heal me. I have borderline personality disorder and bipolar disorder. He didn't supernaturally heal me of those things. But as I was committed to walking in his will, as I was committed to allowing his Holy Spirit to heal me and and refine me and sanctify me, he put resources in my place, in my way. He put great therapists in my way. He put the right medication in my pathway. He put he put the right people there. Mm-hmm. And he empowered me to do the hard work of sitting with tough emotions, of really getting honest with my um, poorly developed coping mechanisms. He really had me get real with what I was using as crutches. And I remember doing some of this work, but holding back a bit. 
I was doing some of it, but I was holding back a bit because I didn't want to fully go there. I didn't want to fully go into the pain. And I remember when my son was young, I used to get these rage attacks. If you're borderline, you may be familiar with rage attacks. And I had this rage attack. And in that moment, I saw fear in my young son's eyes. And I decided there and then that I was not going to pass on the same trauma to my son. And I said, no matter what, no matter how hard, no matter how long it takes, I'm going to do what's necessary to change the legacy of my family. And that really took me on an incredible journey, not just with mental health, but even in spiritual health, really learning how to root my identity in Christ. You know, trauma tries to speak into our identity. Mental illness tries to speak into our identity. The enemy taking our past failures and mistakes tries to speak into our, our identity. And I had a lot of work to do on my identity to really dismantle all the lies and really root it in Christ. What does Jesus say about me? What has God spoken over my life? And how can I have the confidence to show up every day in the way that he's intended me to show up? And that has been life-changing work. So many incredible things in what you're talking about. And also, um, when when you have issues, I, I recognize I was I, I felt like I was on my own from age seven, but I moved out when I was 13, 14, like you as well. Yes. Just I didn't know Christ until um probably four years ago now. So imagine oh. that <laughs> that's when I was saved. But with these mental health issues and the trauma healing space, it's been hijacked largely by the new age spiritual healing community. Yeah. And so it's really hard for moms to stay safe. And there's also this that I would like to talk to you about. There's this, this sidetrack of letting the, the diagnosis or the symptom or the issue become our identity, mm -hmm. which is another thing that happens in the autism space, autism pride, and um, and the mental health space where it becomes almost like a badge you're wearing, like an honor badge, and you don't yeah. want to do anything about it. So yeah. how do we navigate safely? Because one thing that you said that I really loved was you, you asked this question out loud, I see you want to heal trauma and partner up with Jesus, but how? So that question, I would yeah. love to, to dive into that, keeping those two sidetracks in mind. Yeah. Uh, what's so, your take? So there's lots of science on trauma. And so I, I geek out about the science. However, I filter the science through the scripture. And it's actually amazing that the things that we're learning scientifically about trauma have already been in the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. Science isn't teaching us anything new. The, yeah. the formula for overcoming trauma really is in the Bible. And it has to do with how do we renew our mind? How do we address our core beliefs? How do we root our identity in Christ? How do we lean into forgiving the unforgivable? How do we lean into acceptance? How do we lean into grief and allow ourselves to move through all of those things, which are important intersections in healing? The science says, yes, when someone operates in forgiveness, we see a decrease in anxiety, a decrease in depression, an increase in immune function. We know that when we when we walk in acceptance, we move out of victimhood and we're able to better problem solve and create the life that we want. We know that through research, we know scientifically through neuroplasticity that you can actually create new neural pathways of thinking in our brain, which is the renewing of the mind. And so there's this beautiful practical steps that the Bible has laid out that science shows in how we can renew our mind. Now, I do know that in the space of healing, in the space of overcoming, there's this self-help world, secularly, secularly, 
that wants you to believe that you're in control of your healing 100%, that wants you to believe that you can do anything, that wants you to believe that you are limitless. So we have to be careful when we're engaging in this, that we're not making ourselves God. And that's the area of the self-help world. The self-help world wants to elevate you to God. Well, the truth is I can't navigate this on my own. I need God. The truth is I'm not limitless. I'm limited. I need God. The truth is that I, I can't do this on my own. I'm not equipped on my own. However, when I invite the Holy Spirit in, when I use the Bible as my measuring stick, when I use the scripture as the truth that I'm planting in and using the scripture as the healing balm to my soul, then we get true restoration. Then we actually see God redeeming our story and he continues to redeem our story over and over and over again. So it is recognizing that Yes, I do have a role to play, but I'm not the lead. The Holy Spirit is the lead. And my my manual for truth is the Bible. And that's really where we have to come to in our healing. We have to be willing to heal. Yeah. Well, God can supernaturally heal us in my experience in the developed world, at least. So Europe, North America, God often works in partnership with us for our healing and that it's work to do. And part of the redeeming of the story is taking what was meant to harm us and use it to sanctify us, use it to grow us, right? So that is why often he doesn't supernaturally just take away the pain. He walks us through it, right? When it comes to identity, I know that there's often a time where our language speaks to our identity and we have to be so careful. Like with physical illness, you'll hear someone say, I have cancer. Yeah. I have diabetes. They don't say, I am cancer. I am diabetes. And yet, Somehow in the mental health space, we've taken on language that says, I am bipolar, I am borderline. And that language, there's so much power in words. We have to guard what we say out of our mouths. So the cancer patient that has cancer has data. That is a data set that they're going to use to inform their decisions. Yes. I have bipolar. That is just a data set that I use to help inform some of my decisions. It's not who I am. Just like I I have a child, that's going to inform some of the decisions that I make, right? Mm -hmm. Having a child is not my identity. My identity is in Christ as the beloved daughter of the king. I, I have let's say, gluten intolerance, that's going to inform some of my decisions, but it's not who I am. Yeah. So having autism, having borderline, that's just information that we use to make the best decisions that we can for ourselves in a given time. But it's not who we are. And we yeah. are made new in Christ. So even who we were before Christ is not even who we are now. We are made new and we yeah. have been imputed with holiness and righteousness and we are blameless before the king. And that is where we have to root ourselves. Wow, that is so interesting. And autism and borderline are traditionally things that we're told there's nothing you can do about it, or it's something that you're born or you're like imprinted with and it's for life. Yes. So could you, for those who don't know what borderline and bipolar, those two different things, what it is and how you have partnered with Jesus to give you that data and, and use the things that the Holy Spirit has, has laid out for you, but then 
not letting that become your identity, but letting Christ become your identity. And how have you healed through this? Or yeah, continue? Um, borderline is a great example to use because borderline is also neurodivergent, just like autism is. Um, and so borderline is a developmental issue of the brain. So uh, you will find that most people with borderline have had trauma in their past. Trauma as a child, when you exist in a traumatic space as a child, how your brain develops is different. So with borderline, there is can be intense rage. There is something called splitting where you love some someone and then you hate them. There is a lot of impulsive behavior. There's a high suicide rate with borderline. There's a huge fear of abandonment. There's this, a lot of dissociation that happens with borderline. There's this thing of never really knowing who you are, having this chaotic sense of self with borderline. Um, and it impacts how you show up in the world. Um, unfortunately, there's even a lot of therapists that don't like working with borderline because they they find it's too hard, that it's really hard to manage borderline. Now, borderline, unlike bipolar, um, it's, its first line of stabilization is through therapy, not through medication. It's about learning how to essentially rewire your mind. It's not that that brings healing, but in learning the coping strategies and learning how to rewire your mind, you open up your window of tolerance. And so you gain greater capacity to deal with life and not resort to negative coping mechanisms. Mm -hmm. um, and so the leading type of therapy for borderline is called dialectical behavioral therapy. It's a subset of cognitive behavioral therapy, which is really a top down therapy. So if we look at the development of the brain, it's, it's engaging with the prefrontal cortex. And that's how we are doing that type of therapy. Bipolar also has mood swings. So bipolar has a lot of mood swings. The difference is bipolar could have five different mood swings in one day where bipolar is stretched out. You'll have a period of a high, then a period of a low. It's not as frequently changing, although you can, and I've had manic episodes and I've had really depressive episodes that are dangerous to yourself, to your relationships, to your finances. And so with bipolar, the first line of treatment is medication, because that actually has to do with the makeup of your brain, the neurotransmitters in your brain and how they function. So it is more um, of a physiological uh, illness that medicine really does a lot to support. Okay. And so how I invite God into this process is... Letting God inform who I am. And so I've really learned, and I do this with my clients that come to me with mental illness, is that because we have been so quick to assume our identity, we often don't recognize who we are versus who our illness is. Mm. And so one of the things I teach my clients and what I've done myself is I've learned to recognize borderline borderline is not me. Mm -hmm. I see borderline as separate as me, as having impact on me, but it's not me. So I have learned to distinguish when a thought comes that like, oh, that's a borderline thought. That's not a Carla Arges redeemed by the king mm -hmm. thought. And so how I treat that thought is with compassion, but also with authority. Mm -hmm. That that thought, while it's there, and I have compassion for my life that's caused this illness, because you got to have compassion for yourself, you got to have grace for yourself. But borderline doesn't get to make my decisions. Mm -hmm. I see you, borderline, 
but you don't get to make my decisions. So sometimes when borderline gets really loud, I have to make sure that I'm being louder, that the Mm -hmm. truth of God is being louder. And one of the ways I do this is with constantly, so regularly, intentionally speaking truth over myself. So I created a list of all the ways borderline lies to me. And from that list, I created all the truth of God's word. And so for a period of time, while I was learning this new language, every day and every night, I would read out those truth statements, those affirmations, those biblically based affirmations. I didn't just say them when a negative thought came because you have to be in training, You have to be in training, right? Like an Olympian doesn't just show up for the Olympics. They spend four years training. So I was in training. I was reading these true statements, planting them in my brain, literally creating new neural pathways of thought by repetition, consistency of speaking God's truth over my life. Now I'm very proficient in that. Now borderline hardly gets to bully me. Because I've been so proficient in my training that I can recognize borderline, take it captive, put it into obedience of Christ, and act as if I am the child of God, because I am. But it takes intentionality, right? It takes consistency. We don't fight against flesh and blood, right? And and, And I don't say that to say that our illnesses are are evil. I don't believe that, but I do believe that we have, we fight against our mind. We have to fight against our mind. And God knew that the biggest battles would be in our mind. That's why he tells us to renew our mind. That's why he tells us to take thoughts captive. That's why he tells us to put on the helmet of salvation. And if you look at Roman times, that helmet had a lot of function. And one of the functions was identity. The Roman helmet and the guard was a way to identify what unit you were, the fact that you were were Roman. Like this is identity. We're called to put on the identity of Christ. We're called to guard our mind with the salvation. That's the truth of knowing that the blood that was spilt for me has renewed me and has made me new. And it protects me. And for those who don't know Ephesians 6 and don't know the full armor of God, could you just sum up how you're using it in your therapy and sessions and self-therapy as well? Yeah. So the armor of God in Ephesians is our, it's an illustration that Paul gives on how we are to navigate the world and navigate the forces of enemies that are attacking us to navigate the secular world that wants to speak messages, right? The enemy is only one person. He's not omnipresent. So everything you experience is not a direct attack of the enemy, but it can be the result of living in a broken world. So we have to be prepared for that. And so the 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 uh, armor of God is primarily defensive weapon. Um, weaponry. The helmet is defensive. The breastplate is defensive. The belt is defensive. And so we have to say, are we doing the things that we need to do to guard ourselves, guard ourselves against the lies of the enemy, guard ourselves against the lies of lies of the world? And then our one offensive weapon is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, which is why you have to know biblical truth which Mm -hmm. is why you have to get into the word. And I know so many women, um, because I work primarily with women, this could be true for men as well, but feel overwhelmed or intimidated about getting into the Bible. And so they rely on devotions only. Yeah, Devotions are not a bad thing. I write devotions. I have one on Amazon. Um, But that is not meant to be the meat. That's not meant to be the main course. And you've got to get into the word. And I want to encourage you to say that you don't need to be overwhelmed or intimidated by it because as you earnestly seek the truth, the Holy Spirit is with you to reveal it. I think sometimes we have this idea of what Bible study looks like and it's hours and it's quiet time and it's, and it doesn't have to be that way. 
It doesn't have to be that way. In fact, there's multiple ways to study the Bible depending on your learning style. Mm. So that is is going to be important for those who are artis- uh, autistic, who may have different learning styles. There's different ways to learn the Bible um, and to study the Bible. Um, I have a Bible study 101 course that goes through these different ways, but one of them is even uh, Bible journaling and drawing and bringing the Bible to life through drawing. So if you are more creatively bent, if you're more visual, then that may be a great way that you study the Bible. So mm-hmm. I don't want people to be intimidated or or overwhelmed. This is your offensive weapon. And the enemy wants you to be intimidated because he knows how much more powerful you're going to be when you pick up that weapon. Yeah, that's beautiful. So so pick up the Bible. Maybe start if you're new, start with Ephesians so that you can re- that was one of the first things that I learned about when I was completely green and it's so important. Okay, so when you're speaking about these rage fits, I know that that is something that most of the moms that I work with deal with and feel ashamed about. So you were talking about a specific technique to to address that with God's truth. How can you could you could you inspire someone who are dealing with these rage attacks and aren't able to will themselves out of it? What yeah. to do? Yeah. Um that's hard, right? And we get rage and then we have shame. Yeah. And we get into the cycle of rage and shame, and it can be really hard to break out of. Um, one thing I always say is you've got to start with compassion. You've got to give yourself compassion for where you're at, and you've got to learn to forgive yourself. Forgiveness is not just for other people. I think sometimes the hardest people we have to forgive is ourselves. When we have shame over what we've done, I would say that we have to be proactive. There's there's two things you have to do. Be proactive in reducing the number of times you experience rage or reducing the intensity that you, you, you feel it. And then the second thing is having the right coping skills when it emerges. So how do we reduce rage? One of the things that we have to look at and be honest with ourselves is what's on our plate. Rage often emerges when we are over capacity, that we don't have the capacity for what's happening right now, and so we explode. Rage often covers sadness and fear, and so it can be that in that moment, you're afraid you're doing it wrong, you're sad that you're experiencing this, but your go-to emotion, the covering for that is rage. And so really looking at what are your habits of thriving? Where do you have rhythms of rest in your day? Where can you plan rhythms of rest? Are you moving your body regularly? Are you eating nutrition that supports mood? Are you renewing your mind every day? So these are my, I call them four pillars of thriving and it's renewing your mind, moving your body, fueling your body and resting your body. You have to make these things disciplined in your life and habits in your life. You have to support yourself to have more capacity to deal with the hard stuff. And so those are big things that I say that you have to find ways to put yourself first so that you can approach your day, approach the difficulties with greater capacity. Yes. In the moment of rage, I have tips that work for me. Um, and I've learned them through borderline and dealing with borderline rage. Um, there's a thing called tip skills, and it has to do with temperature, intense exercise, pace breathing, and progressive muscle control. One of the ones that works best for me is actually temperature. And that has to do with dumping your face and cold ice water. Mm -hmm. 
when we are in a rage, we're actually in a fight position. So in terms of the science of our body, our nervous system has gone into fight or flight. So we are in the sympathetic nervous system. We're in fight or flight. In order to re- to calm that down, we need to activate our parasympathetic nervous system, that place where we're, we find calm. And so these tips help to activate the parasympathetic system to take us out of fight or flight. So when we put our face in cold water, it kind of shocks our system, it regulates our breathing and enacts the vagus nerve, which is a nerve that helps bring calm. The I for intense exercise is when you're feeling that rage, you all of a sudden stop and do like 25 jumping jacks yeah. and you burn that energy out. And that gives you a moment to release endorphins, to increase um, happy hormones and give you that window to calm down. I love it. Paced breathing is another way that we activate our parasympathetic nerve. And that is when we do something like box breathing, where we breathe in for three seconds, hold it for three seconds, release it for three seconds, and then hold it for three seconds. And we repeat. And we will find that calmness comes. Often I will do this with my hand on my belly and my hand on my heart. And do the breathing. And it activates the parasympathetic nerve that helps bring us out of fight or flight. The other one is progressive muscle relaxation. And that is maybe where you say, okay, I'm raging. I'm going to lie down for two minutes. And in that two minutes, you're going to focus on I'm clenching my right butt cheek, then releasing it. I'm clenching my shoulders and releasing it and getting intentional of tuning into your body and uh, flexing and releasing different muscles. This again takes your brain into a different spot and your body into a different spot that allows for relaxation. Wow. And how have you dealt with the shame and the guilt and also healing and forgiving yourself in collaboration with your child? Because I remember when my child was the sickest he was also extremely aggressive before he his symptoms were turned around and also before i understood that many of the things that he was dealing with had to do with nutritional aspects as well Mm -hmm. but uh, i remember getting so furious because of this constant violent and screaming and he would just say shut up shut up shut up all day long so I I grabbed his shoulders and I remember just yelling you're ruining my life and even when I'm talking about this now he's 25 and it's still something that really it's grief And I know that that grief and shame and guilt, it's with a lot of moms on a daily basis who are dealing with this excessive aggression in their children. I know that was a long question, but how did you do that? Because, yeah, you've experienced experienced this as well. Well, one of the things that you just demonstrated that is helpful is shining the light on the thing causing you shame. So shame likes to live in secrecy. Shame likes to live in isolation and it gains power and control. If we can in safe spaces and safe people and safe communities shed light on what's causing us shame, we start to diminish its power. So one thing is to not let shame isolate you, to not let it be a dirty secret that you're keeping. Because secrets like that destroy us. When it comes to forgiving ourselves, this is where we have to go back to compassion. Is recognizing that you don't have all the tools all the time. And that we are imperfect humans. And would I have liked to have made a better decision? Yes. But given everything that I knew at the time, given what my capacity was at the time, I did my best. 
and leaning into that compassion. I think sometimes we're afraid to give ourselves a compassion because we think we're letting ourselves off the hook. Compassion isn't about validating our choices as right. It's about having empathy for what we were experiencing when we made those choices. And, and really and leaning into that. that with your child, did you say this is what what was going on in, in me and this is why it happened? Yes. So the other thing, so there's, there's about what is shame doing to ourselves? And then there's the as aspect of repair. So where we've caused rupture, we have to lean into repair. And how we do that is with honest conversations to say, I didn't mean to do that. And th you have to do this with what is age appropriate. When my son was very young and I was working through borderline and bipolar, I said, mommy has a little bit of sickness in her brain. And sometimes that makes her go to a black spot and it takes control over her. And it makes her do things that she doesn't mean and that she doesn't want to do and so I kind of explained it to him like that and that also gave us language that when I was feeling rage come up I could say oh I feel the black spot coming mommy's just going to take a second and try to get control over it and so it gave us language on how to describe it an apology like we need to apologize to our children to say I'm really sorry that that happened that wasn't about you that was about me You, I love. You are lovely. Because whenever we lose control, it actually isn't about our kids. Mm -hmm. It's about what we're experiencing in the moment and our ability. How are we triggered? What wounds are being brushed up against in that moment, right? It never really is about our kids. Even if they're misbehaving, it's about us. And so being able to say to them, I'm sorry, that was not about you. I don't want you to own that. I don't want you to internalize that. I'm so sorry. Here's what I'm doing so it doesn't happen again, right? Because we also, repentance requires a change. Yeah. Repentance requires a change. So here's what I'm doing so this doesn't happen again. Yeah. And then And take that action. Yes, which were the, the tips that you shared with us before. Yes. Is it okay for us to talk about some of the things, the symptoms that your child has been struggling with, or you want to keep that private? Because if you do, that's totally understandable. Oh, no, we can we can talk about it. Um, he has been uh, open now. As he gets older, I ask his permission more, but he has been open in letting me share certain aspects of his OCD and the ones that I know he's not open to me sharing. I won't share. No. But he has OCD. OCD, if you don't know, is a class of anxiety disorders. Um, OCD is actually also neurodivergent as well. So he has that. He also has a tick disorder that goes along with it. Um, but OCD has to do with obsessions and compulsions. And the way Hollywood has painted OCD is really far from what the reality is. And because I did not understand OCD, my only exposure to OCD was through the Hollywood lens. I did not recognize it in my son. And we went through many years of a lot of pain trying to figure out what was happening with my son before we got the proper diagnosis. But um, OCD is not just about liking things neat. So for example, like Monica on Friends, I don't know if you have friends where you live the show. Uh, she liked things neat, but she got joy out of doing it. That was, OCD doesn't give you joy. If you like your house really tidy and clean, you don't have OCD because there's nothing about OCD that the person likes. It's like if you don't, have your remote the certain way your family is going to die. Like that's not pleasant. It's not just an aesthetically pleasing thing. There's, and you have to do the compulsion in order to satisfy the obsession. Yeah. And if you can't do the compulsion, 
you can really start to spiral in the in the obsession. There's different themes with OCD. You can have religious themes. You can have contamination themes. You can have perfection themes. Um, my son definitely has contamination themes. Um, and actually... He just lost his job, I think, in part because of how he struggles with OCD. So he's 15. He had a part-time job at a restaurant um, where he was the host and seating people. And then he had to clear tables. And he told me a few weeks ago that he was having a really hard time with touching napkins that people had used. It was so hard on his OCD that going to that job was so hard. And I think because it was so hard, he avoided doing it or didn't do it well because he didn't really want to touch the things. And he ended up losing his job, which is unfortunate, but also a reality of people with mental illness, right? You have to, and probably for autism too, you actually have to find a job that fits the limitations and the positive sides of your illness, right? Because there, there is positives that come from some of these things as well. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious about your approach to it because in, in, in my approach and with my family and the way that I um, help moms, we also look at the the biochemical, bio individual, nutritional. Uh, yeah. Effect. So a lot of these children have undermethylation, which is high histamine, low methyl, and the low um, methyl affects neurotransmitters like dopamine, serotonin, and it also creates this rigidity, and that can be adjusted with certain nutrients. So there's been a lot of nonprofit studies on that. We can talk about that on another occasion. But I'm, so for my, my son, it was flicking light switches. It was, he had to pack his whole room for him to be willing to go anywhere, meaning- yes my bed my table all the chairs in one bag for me to leave the room and obviously that's not sustainable yes yeah. those are the things that he lost now it's a milder things like the way we load the dishwasher has to be in a certain way you know things like yeah. that but yeah. culpable. it's it's manageable so what's your approach towards dealing with and helping people with OCD, including your own child? So one is teaching him to recognize the voice of OCD, for him to recognize it's not his own voice. Yeah. So being able to determine, oh, this is an OCD thought. And so it requires a different action than if it's my own thought. So really teaching him to distinguish the two. We really um, believe a lot in movement as a coping mechanism. And so he is involved in sports. He works out. Um, movement is so, I think, such an underrated medicine, really, for a lot of conditions. Um, we, he eats really nutritious foods. We don't do a lot of processed foods, no dyes, things like that. So monitoring that. And then when it comes to my own son, I will say I struggle with reassurance. So one of his compulsions is reassurance. So there's four ways that compulsions can present itself. One is physical, like flipping light switches. Yeah. The other is internal rumination. So maybe internal counting, internal, so internal things. Avoidance is actually a compulsion and so is reassurance seeking. And so my son seeks reassurance a lot and it can be hard as a mom when you know, if you reassure him, you're allowing his OCD to grow stronger because every time you complete a compulsion, you strengthen OCD. And so he comes to me for reassurance. Like, are you sure I'm not going to get sick, mommy? Like, this is one thing that comes up. Like, if he touches something small or something touches his arm that he thinks is, are you sure I'm not going to get sick, mommy? Are you sure I'm not going to? Or we have to do a balance with working out because it becomes an obsession. Am I working out enough, mommy? Like, so we have to be careful with that. And it can be hard for me to refuse reassurance. 
this is something I'm still working on because as a mom, when you see your kid in distress wanting reassurance, you want to reassure them. You want to tell them everything's going to be okay. But that's actually not what you should do with OCD. And so it's learning for me to say answer once. And then when it keeps coming up to say, that's OCD talking and I'm not going to talk to your OCD. Wow. And that's Jeez. really, it's hard. I'm still learning this. I'm still learning this. Yeah. Um, but it also helps him when I say that for him to recognize, oh yes, that's OCD's voice. And do you also um, partner with Jesus in this work with your child? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah, do you also um, partner with Jesus in this work? Oh, with him? yes, yes, definitely. So he has a strong faith of his own. Um, and I reiterate to him, you know, you have to get into the word. So he has a Bible study practice of his own. You have to know who God says you are. Um, you have to know that God loves you and has compassion for what you're dealing with. And he doesn't leave you alone. So faith in our house is foundational. Like everything that we do is through the lens of, of faith. Um, And I often remind him of his namesake. So his name is Caleb. And I often remind him of Caleb in the Bible, of Caleb's great faith and great reassurance of who God was and of who God said he was. And so I encourage him to really get to know his namesake and to em like emulate him and what he does. Wow, you're amazing. It's so good. One of the things that I really just hear, we, we've covered a lot of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, but there's two things that I just find so fascinating about the things that you're teaching, which is one, perfectionism as a trauma response and um, procrastination. So preparation, recognizing the, tw the difference between preparation for change and procrastination. So I have a lot of moms with those two stress responses that I deal with in a certain way, but I'm so intrigued by your take on this. Yeah, so perfectionism, in my experience, is born out of childhood trauma, where you likely had to have everything just so. You had to earn affection by overachieving. Things had to be perfect. And in a way, you have developed this reality in your head, which is not true, that if I can control everything, I will be safe, right? Mm -hmm. Trauma is always looking for safety. And so this idea is if I control everything and everything is perfect, I'm safe. And in this moment, we have to recognize that when we aim for perfection, we're aiming for God. We're aiming to become gods ourselves because we are not perfect and we can't be perfect. So we have to be real about the idols that we are building up in our life. And perfectionism is an idol in our life. Now, the root of it may be trauma, but we still have to recognize what it's become in our life so that we can take it down. Um, God has not called us to perfection God has called us to sanctification in him. God has imputed holiness on us through Christ Jesus and what he did at the cross. But God does not call us to perfection. He calls us to surrender and obedience. And so that is when we then listen to that voice of the enemy, the accuser, oh, it's not, you're not good enough. You should be better. Look at all these different diets. You need to understand every supplement. There's a lot of almost OCD perfectionism in the recovery warrior mom community. Yeah. So well, I would say you see the evidence itself. When you're aiming for perfection, you're burnt out. Your relationships suffer with your kids, with your spouse, with other people. Um When you are working on perfection, you end up with an element of self-loathing because you can never be perfect. And so you're always falling short of your standard. So there's shame cycle in that. So you can see the negative effects of, of perfectionism. 
So my question would be to you, what are you willing to do to break that so that you can have healthier relationships, so that you can give God glory, so that you can actually walk in the plan and purpose God has over you because your perfectionism is a stumbling block to what God wants to do in and through you. And this comes with practice and this comes with really, you know, identity again, This comes down to rehearsing what your identity is in Christ and recognizing it's okay if it's not perfect, because actually the Bible says God's strength is made manifest in my weakness. It is actually a good thing to be weak and imperfect before the Lord, because that gives him full license to move in all of his power Mm. and learning. It's a practice. None of this happens overnight. It's intentional practice where I choose to release this to you, Lord. And then you stop yourself from acting. I choose to release this to you, Lord. And you say it over and over again. I choose to release perfectionism to you. I I commit to only checking the list once, you know, whatever it is. I it, it It's putting our choices in action. And it's hard. It's hard. It takes time to do it. It's it's not going to be perfect, right? So it takes time, but it starts with a choice. It starts with the choice. But it, it almost trickles into procrastination because I see moms, sometimes I'm like, I need to close my Facebook group because I've, I've, I have 4,000 moms in there. And if I don't remind them daily, they will keep on looking for that perfect supplement, whatever it is out there, instead of looking to God. But the perfectionism can lead to procrastination as well, because you constantly look for the next big thing or the next shot. So- There's actually two ways that perfectionism can lead to procrastination. One, the fear of not doing it perfect so you don't do it at all, yes. which it sits in the back burner, or you never actually take action because you're looking for the perfect plan, which is kind of what you've described. Ooh, I love that. So um, last two things. Um, you have this question that you ask moms or people is it godly sacrificial love or is it a trauma response and if you could touch on depression anxiety in that connection because we haven't covered that and i know it's a thing for almost everybody who are dealing with these things in their children yes so we often trauma will say that we have to get everyone to like us And that we have to be a people pleaser and we have to say yes to everyone. And there is this fear that if someone doesn't like us, it's evidence of what we believe to be true about ourselves anyways, that we're not lovable and that we're not worthy and that we're not enough. And so we'll say yes and yes and yes. And oftentimes as Christians, we'll put it under the guise of, This is servant leadership. This is being a servant. God has called us to sacrifice. And I think that one of the things we have to remember is that Jesus, yes, he was a servant leadership, but he did not sacrifice himself until it was time to sacrifice himself. He did not let people walk all over him. People hated Jesus as much as people loved Jesus. And so If we are to be like Jesus, we have to get comfortable with the fact that not everyone's going to like us. Jesus had boundaries. We have to get comfortable with the fact that we have boundaries too. Because here's what happens. If we're saying yes to everything, and it's not bad things usually, but if we're saying yes to everything, every good thing, we're not saving enough yes for the great thing God wants to do in us. And so aligning our yeses to God's great plan for us and being comfortable with saying no, that is so important. And that was a hard thing for me to learn myself as someone with borderline who has this huge fear of rejection and this huge fear of abandonment. 
um, what would happen with me is I would just stay away from people altogether because I couldn't bear the thought of someone rejecting me. And so me, for me, it's like, how can I say yes more often to human um, connection? Um, so figuring out what that balance looks like for you. Um, and depression and anxiety, to touch on that, I believe that there's an overdiagnosis of depression and anxiety when really what it is is unhealed trauma. And unfortunately, in psychiatry, and this is where they get their diagnosis, complex trauma is not an option. Uh, it's not part of the diagnostic schedule. And so a psychiatrist can only diagnose based on what he's allowed to diagnose. And complex PTSD, complex trauma is not diagnosable. And so you get people diagnosed with depression or anxiety or other things that really it's just unhealed wounds from trauma. And what they need to do is heal from the trauma. Yeah. And so I would say if you're suffering from anxiety and depression, ask yourself, what wound do you have? Where might you be wounded? Maybe you don't identify as having trauma because you weren't physically or sexually abused. But again, I want to remind you that trauma is about any event where you didn't feel safe and that you felt helpless. Mm -hmm. That is what produces trauma in us. Mm -hmm. Wow. Carla, that is just incredible. What a beautiful piece of work that God has chosen for you to, to bring to us. And I just want to thank you so much for sharing. And If people want to learn more from you, where can they find you? I definitely want you to teach my community as well about this. But where can people find find you um, online? So you can go to my website, CarlaArges.com. I hang out most on Instagram at Carla.Arges. And I'd love to give you, your audience, a free workbook on how to renew your mind. So how do you do that? So I'll give you the link and you can put it in the show notes and they can download it. It's a free workbook on how do you actually practically renew your mind? What are the steps to take to do that? Amazing. Well, with that, I'll link to all of those details and information in that workbook. And I'm going to dive into that book myself for sure. Thank you, Carla, for your time and for your heart for Jesus. Uh Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It's been an honor. Thank you. I really hope that this episode blessed you and gave you some peace and healing and tools for your turnaround or your recovery process. If you want to connect with Carla, if you want to connect with me, if you want all the links and uh, get access to Carla's free healing tool, go to barefootautismwarriors.com. Even if you are listening to this on Spotify or any other platform, give me some stars, like this podcast, share it with someone who's struggling. You know that these symptoms that we have in autism families, and if we have depression, if we have anxiety, it's a high-risk situation for suicidal tendencies and actually suffering from both mental and physical illnesses. So we need to save each other. We need to come together as a community, share these stories and share the hope. So with that, I thank you for being here. I thank you for being a friend to the podcast and see you next time.